So it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce Lily New. Uh, Lily is uh, working with uh, Matthias Mann's group at uh, the Center for Protein Research, University of Copenhagen, who will be speaking about mass spectrometry based proteomics for biomarker discovery and PQTL mapping. Hi, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, I guess. Um, as introduced, I'm uh, Lily, and I'm a postdoc with Matthias at the University of Copenhagen. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, talk about some of the work I've done through my PhD and postdoc. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me, especially uh, Simon Rasmussen, who is also my postdoc supervisor. So in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I will introduce you to the blood plasma proteome and MS-based proteomics, followed by two concrete studies. Uh, the first one is about biomarker discovery uh, for liver disease. This one has uh, already been published last year. Um, in this uh, study, we integrated clinical data, plasma and liver proteomics data, and also patient follow-up data. And then uh, the second study is about uh, protein quantum trait loci discovery using mass spectrometry based proteomics. Um, this one hasn't been published yet, but we did uh, upload a preprint on my archive in case anyone is interested. And um, yes, I also like to say if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt anytime. So the blood plasma proteome is a composite and uh, or mixture of different proteins from different cell types and uh, different tissues. Um, they could be uh, actively secreted into the bloodstream to perform key functions such as uh, immunity, uh, transport, blood clotting, and also maintaining the homeostasis of the blood. It could also be proteins that are leaked from damaged cells therefore reflecting biological pathological processes occurring elsewhere in the body. So how many proteins are there on, in, the, in the blood plasma? We don't know yet, but according to the plasma proteome database, uh, more than 10,000 proteins have been de detected in the human blood uh, plasma, and more than 5,000 of them have uh, mass spectrometry-based uh, evidence. And when it comes to uh, proteomics analysis, um, I have to say a mass spectrometry uh, based on proteomics is my favorite uh, technology, and it's also the most popular and most commonly used. Um, apart from that, there are also affinity based approaches, such as the um, proximity extension assay commercialized by the OLINK and also Aptima based um, Sumo Scan platform. But for today's talk, I will focus on mass spectrometry based proteomics. Um, Bottom-up proteomics workflow is the most commonly used uh, workflow in MS-based proteomics. And by bottom-up, uh, uh, we mean we don't measure the intact proteins, but rather we first extract the proteins from a biological clinical sample of interest, followed by set, st uh, set specific cleavage um, of the protein into short peptides, which are then uh, further separated by uh, liquid chromatography based on their differential uh, hydrophobicity. Then the peptides will be eluted and injected sequentially into the mass spectrometer for analysis. And mass spectrometer, uh, in a, like a simple word, is a very fancy weighing machine. So um, it tells you the intensity and mass overcharge of uh, all the incoming ions at a given time. So essentially, what we what we record uh, from the mass spectrometer is uh, two types of mass spectrum: MS1 or the full scan. So it records the intensity and mass overcharge of all the precursor ions um, at a given time. And then the MS2 or tendon mass spectra, um, it records the same uh, type of information, but instead of precursor ions, it records the fragment ions of uh, the precursor ions that you select for targeted fragmentation. And that's also how we use, um, how we uh, do the peptide identification by uh, comparing experimentally generated and in silico predicted MS2 spectra. So once a peptide is identified, they will be mapped to individual proteins, which are then further assembled into protein groups in case uh, no unique peptide was um, or has been detected that can distinguish between two proteins that are very similar in terms of their amino acid sequences. And there are different techniques for protein quantification. For uh, large-scale measurement, uh, label-free quantification is the most commonly used so far. Um, 
I do want to talk about uh, how to assess and report programs data quality, especially if the data set hasn't been described or published uh, in, in other studies. So for large scale um, sample measurement, uh, we typically include these so-called quality assessment samples. In case of plasma, it's a pooled plasma that we allocate onto the, the different um, uh, sample plates. So with these technical replicates, we could assess the variability of the entire workflow from sample handling into the very end step of uh, data acquisition. And with these technical replicates together with your sample um, study samples, then you could look into data set quality. Um, and I would look at uh, um, two types of uh, data quality metrics, proteome depths and uh, quantification reproducibility. So in terms of proteome depths, we would be interested to report the number of peptides and proteins as well as like the peptides per protein. Um, as a standard, we also uh, report the dynamic range. So how many orders of magnitude do the proteins cover in your data set? And in terms of uh, quantification accuracy slash reproducibility, um, we typically also report the uh, number of data points per chromatographic peak and uh, the Pearson correlation between your technical replicates. And we also calculate, uh, which is kind of uh, the most important metric, coefficient of variation uh, for all the proteins based on your technical replicates. And last but not the least, we also report the uh, data completeness before and after uh, filtering. So as you know, in MS-based proteomics, we have uh, missing values, especially for the lowly abundant proteins. Um, so naturally, these are the key data processing steps. Uh, typically, I would uh, like uh, do a PCA first because it gives you a very good overview of how your samples distribute and what is the biggest factor that um, separates or explains the variability. Um, so you could also see if you have batch effect and outliers, et cetera. Um, so I would do a filter for data completeness at both uh, sample level and also protein level. So if a sample has two less proteins quantified as compared to the rest of uh, the samples, then I would typically exclude that because it's um, it, it would be a technical error. Um, and then I would do uh, like also as a standard procedure, we do missing data imputation and batch correction, et cetera, if there, there is. So I want to highlight that uh, MS-based proteomics is a rapidly developing field. And uh, this roadmap is uh, just from my own perspective. So it's definitely very biased towards my own experience. So as you can see from the very first study that I measured in Matthias group in 2017 and to the very recent one, we already experienced uh, upgrades or updates in the protocol and workflow and uh, also the instruments um, that we use. So for today's talk, I will focus on uh, two studies uh, that were where I acquired the data in 2019 and also 2021, respectively. So with this, I would like to uh, switch gear to talk about the first study. Um, and uh, yes, so you can read about it uh, if you're interested in, in the more details. Um, so in the first uh, study, it's uh, about biomarker discovery using proteomics, in this case for alcohol-related liver disease. And uh, we uh, collaborated with uh, medical doctors at the Odense University Hospital in Denmark. Um, we included three sub-cohorts, one cohort of uh, 137 healthy individuals, then a discovery cohort of uh, alcohol-related liver disease, or ALD for short, um, and within this discovery cohort, we had uh, 361 patients who had liver biopsy because they have a higher liver stiffness as measured by transient elastography. Then we also have a subset of the patients who did not show any sign of uh, increased uh, liver stiffness. So they, they were not biopsied. So that's in total 98 of those in that subset. And then we had the independent cohort of 63 um, patients for the validation. Um, so together, all these participants really covered the entire histopathological spectrum of chronic liver disease and the progression from healthy liver to 
um, simple steatosis, fatty liver, um, until the very end stage of liver fibrosis, uh, which is cirrhosis. And uh, for our part, we performed a proteomics analysis on all the plasma samples within two weeks. And also we measured 79 liver biopsies within one week. And the aim of the, uh, of the study was to identify biomarkers for predicting the presence and progression of liver disease. We also want to assess the tissue specificity of the protein signals um, since we have this paired liver biopsy and uh, blood study design. Um, so this is a busy slide. I want to walk you through the data and uh, analysis. So as mentioned, we have uh, three subcohorts. We have different types of data, um, including histologic staging and scoring. So that's based on liver biopsy. And what you get is, uh, is an ordinal, uh, ordinal score uh, for three uh, major pathological, pathological features of liver disease. That's fibrosis uh, from F0 to 4, with no fibrosis to cirrhosis, inflammatory activity on a scale of 0 to 5, and steatosis uh, up to 3. And uh, then we also had uh, all kinds of blood tests, including uh, state-of-the-art uh, blood tests for liver disease. We also have access to uh, follow-up data. And then we performed the liver and plasma proteomics. So for bioinformatics analysis, it was quite straightforward. We performed a differential abundance analysis. In this case, we did ANCOVA, adjusting for covariates such as age, sex, BMI, and uh, uh, abstinent um, status, and so on, followed by functional enrichment analysis. We also performed correlation to um, histologic scores of the protein levels, in this case, Spearman correlation. Um, so we performed these analysis in the liver and plasma proteome data set separately. Then we integrate it to identify the co-dysregulated proteins. And then for the machine learning part, um, after several rounds of discussions with, the, with our medical um, collaborators, we in the end decided to build uh, three models for um, three binary classification tasks. We want to identify patients who have uh, significant fibrosis, uh, mild inflammatory activity, and any uh, steatosis. And then we have uh, 15 best-in-class clinical markers to benchmark uh, our model performance against. Um, then we also assessed the uh, prognostic performance of the, of the models at, uh, at predicting liver-related events and all-cause mortality. Um, and since we also have the healthy cohort and the subset of individuals in the discovery cohort who did not have increased liver uh, stiffness, we took advantage of those to assess how good is the model at ruling out disease. And in the end, we also assess the model performance in an independent uh, uh, validation cohort. So as I mentioned, um, so these are the distribution of the disease variety for the three pathological features, fibrosis, inflammation, uh, inflammatory activity, and steatosis. And uh, we, uh, so we, in the end, decided to do a binary classification and kind of by a coincidence, it's a quite a balanced uh, um, data set. And uh, the distribution is quite similar between the discovery and validation cohort. Uh, one of the results uh, I want to present here is, um, so when we compare the differentially abundant proteins in the liver proteomics data set and in the plasma data set, we identified 46 overlapping proteins. Um, and when we plotted their abundance across the fibrosis stage, then we could see they, uh, most of the proteins, they agree with each other in terms of the changing trend. So they increase when fibrosis stage also increases, but we do have uh, some proteins here. They kind of don't agree in, in the liver and plasma, and it would be worth um, investigating um, the, the reason. See you tomorrow. Yes. Um, um, yes. Sorry for that. Um, yes. So, and when we look at the proteins based on their functions and the protein classes, then it also makes a lot of sense. Uh, they um, they are very aligned with the clinical observation about liver disease. So they are involved in immune and inflammatory response. 
Uh, there are also extracellular matrix constituents that are involved in angiogenesis and coagulation. And I was also happy to see that we could recapitulate three of six uh, proteins that we previously identified as candidate markers for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in a smaller um, human study. And these are the results for the three um, uh, proteomics models. Um, so these are um, like results from uh, five or 10 times cross-validation in the discovery cohort alone. Um, and on average, we uh, we had uh, a record you'll see of 0.85 to 0.91 for the three models and up to uh, two thirds of the proteins in the respective marker panels also have concordant changes in the liver. And to put the model performance in context of the um, existing best in class clinical tests, um, again, this is a uh, result from the discovery cohort, then we could see the proteins models um, have at least a comparable performance or superior performance as compared to the other clinical tests. And uh, uh, by looking at the healthy cohorts, uh, uh, the results show that the proteins models are also highly accurate uh, at excluding significant and advanced fibrosis as well as hepatic inflammation um, in these two uh, subpopulations. And these are results from the validation cohort um, so we had a uh, rocket you'll see of ranging between 0 0.79 to 0.87 for the three uh, proteins models in the independent validation cohort. And for the fibrosis and the inflammation model, we also have a, a higher rocket you'll see uh, as compared to the other best in class comparators, but not for steatosis. There, it performed worse. Uh, so as I said, we also have access to the electronic health records. So we extracted the follow-up data um, for a median of uh, five, five years. And we defined two primary outcomes. The first is a liver-related event. It's an 11 event uh, composite outcome. So including um, some ascites and hepatocellular carcinoma. So these are uh, the common cellulosis related complications. Um, and the second primary outcome is all cause mortality. And then we computed the uh, Herald C index. So these are results done by my cl uh, by clinical partners. So I simply sent them the uh, risk score predicted by the product models, and then they computed the Herald C index, which is a concordance index. Essentially, you want to calculate the concordance between time to event and the risk score. So for a patient who has a shorter time to event, you would expect a higher risk score. And so their results show that uh, the fibrosis uh, pr or proteomics models for fibrosis and inflammation are also uh, highly accurate measures for predicting future liver-related events and or cause mortality are uh, even superior than the other currently um, existing clinical tests. So this is already the last slide of uh, the first study. Uh, I was frequently um, asked, especially by my uh, clinical uh, collaborators, to to check their favorite protein in my data set. How do how does that protein change in different pathological conditions of liver disease? Then I got inspired. So why not make the data more easily explorable? So I uh, made a web-based interactive data exploration app using the um, Dash Python framework. So they can just uh, put in their favorite protein and check. Um, how the protein changes in different um, disease stage. So to summarize, uh, in this study, we identified the three protein marker panels for detecting liver fibrosis, inflammation, and steatosis, with two of them surpassing existing standard uh, clinical tests. The model performance was also successfully validated in an independent validation cohort. And the three protein marker panels identified for diagnostic purposes, also accurate prognostic measures for predicting future liver related events and all cause mortality. Um, and with this, I want to already uh, switch to the second study, unless we have uh, questions that we want to address now. Okay, I guess I'll just continue. Um, so the second study uh, is about genetic regulation of the human plasma proteome in children and adolescents. Um, and you're welcome to check out the MedArchive preprint for more details. 
Um, so first, I want to just to briefly introduce uh, PQTL mapping. Uh, it's an approach to identify associations between genetic variants and uh, protein levels. Essentially, it's protein-wide uh, GWAS. Um, you do want to have a large cohort to have uh, some kind of a statistical power. So if you look at the existing literature, the existing PQTL studies have a sample size ranging between hundreds to tens of thousands of individuals like the UK Biobank and also the um, um, DECO Icelandic cohorts. Um, so then you uh, perform this association test using a linear model, or linear risk model uh, between the, the genotype allele levels and your protein levels. And you do this for each of the individual protein and uh, you get summary statistics and can be visualized in Manhattan plot what you typically see in GWAS. And when it comes to reporting uh, the number of PQTLs, um, you want to take into uh, consideration of linkage disequilibrium, this non-random association between variants. And uh, you do want to, to have an approach to short or shortlist your variants because some of the variants might be detected as uh, significant simply because they are correlated with the causal variants. And there are also different ways of doing this. This is also something I I hope we can also discuss a bit later on. Um, so when I look into the literature, there is uh, really no unified uh, standard in doing this. Um, and people do uh, with two approaches. One approach is this uh, distance and LD-based clumping procedure or grouping procedure. So they only report the most significant variant within a certain distance and within a certain LD uh, threshold. And then another approach uh, took uh, maybe even uh, one step further to uh, perform conditional analysis and try to identify the independent uh, signals sort of in the in the direction of a fine mapping. And even within the two approaches, people do it differently with different um, kind of um, definitions or uh, thresholds. So, but um, anyway, once you have a short list, the or the SNPs that is associated with a protein, you could visualize the results in the box plot. Um, this box plot will give you a, a very instant uh, impression of the effect size, um, as well as the manner allele frequency. And this is only for one protein, and at protein level, then you could visualize the PQTLs in this two-dimensional plot, with uh, y-axis being the protein position, the transcription start site, and the x-axis being the, uh, the variant position. And depending on how far away they are located, they are from each other, you could categorize the PQTLs into cis and trans. And once you have identified the PQTLs, it can be very powerful um, in downstream a variety of downstream applications, such as uh, functional interpretation of GWAS loci um, to infer the causal relationships between proteins and diseases. You can also use them for drug repositioning or to identify novel drug targets and infer disease regulatory pathways. And looking at the literature, there have already been dozens of the studies um, done on blood proteins. Um, and this is an overview. Um, so I color coded the studies based on the proteomics platform that was used in that study. As you can see, it's dominated by affinity based uh, approaches. So these ones here. They are um, they were done by the sumo scan platform, and then there are also these violet uh, ones here using the O-link uh, target uh, panels. And there were several studies uh, that uses uh, mass spectrometry, but they are in general limited by sample size or protein depths, like these ones uh, color coded in red here. And if we were to position the current study on this map, it will be somewhere around here. Um, so I also want to advertise this uh, very uh, nice resource. So it's a constantly updated uh, resource of, of published GWAS with proteomics. Now I want to introduce the cohort. Um, so we use the subset of the Hallback study um, as the discovery cohort. The Hallback study was formerly known as the Danish Childhood Obesity Data and uh, Biobank has a focus on um, childhood obesity and developing tailored intervention um, treatment strategies. So we included uh, more than 2,000 uh, children aged between 5 to 20. Uh, around half of them were recruited from the obesity clinic and the other half from the general population. 
And we'll also have all kinds of metadata on this cohort. And most relevant for, for the study um, I will be talking about today would be the SNP based genotyping. And then we performed uh, MS based plasma proteomics. I want to quickly uh, mention the proteomics workflow. I guess the majority of the audience here are bioinformaticians, uh, so you might not be so interested in the technical workflow, but I, I do want to uh, mention it because it, uh, it's very important to know uh, when when it comes to assessing the proteomics uh, data quality. Um, so uh, in total, we analyzed more than 2000 plasma samples, and uh, in between, we also included 94 quality assessment samples for the entire measurement period, and the samples were prepared in six batches. Um, and the samples were, were prepared using a semi-automated liquid handling system uh, with 384 uh, samples per day throughput. And then finally, we were measured uh, with a throughput of 60 samples per day. So the entire measurement took one and a half months. And this is the overview of the dataset quality. Um, so we quantified more than 3,000 peptides uh, per sample and uh, more than 400 proteins per sample. Um, and based on the 94 quality assessment samples, uh, we had a median CV of 18%, and in total 310 proteins had a CV below 30%. I also want to mention when you look at CV, which is uh, the most commonly used metric to to benchmark how reproducible a, a, tech, a workflow is, uh, you do want to um, know like how the CV is uh, calculated, um, because in this case it's a it's a workflow uh, replicate, so you would expect a higher CV than if you just do like uh, continuous injection, like uh, basically measuring the same sample but in uh, different runs. Um, and based on principal components, we did not observe a batch effect, and the two underlying population could also be separated um, already in the first uh, component. Um, so this is all very good. Uh, when, when I look at the a good uh, principal component four and five, uh, there I could see some slight batch effects. So in the end, I still did the batch effect uh, correction using uh, combat. Okay, we planned a different analysis on this cohort, uh, but uh, for today's talk, I will focus on PQTL analysis. And uh, just to briefly um, remind everyone about the data set. So in total, we had around 2000 individuals and after quality control of the genomics data, we ended up with 5.2 million variants. So that's uh, with uh, impute info score of about 0.7 and man earlier frequency of about 0.05. And for the proteomics data after quality control, we had 420 proteins. And that's in total 2.2 billion association tests. Um, I want to highlight this because I was very impressed that all the, you know, the, the PQT analysis were done within 24 hours uh, in computer room, uh, thanks to parallel processing. So yes, so I, I performed, uh, used the linear mix model in JAMA um, and to perform the association tests. And uh, in the end, um, these are the numbers that I got. Um, so I also performed the clamping using P-Link with, uh, with a, a R-square value of 0.2 and a distance of one megabase. Um, and in the end, with a genome-wide significance uh, level, we uh, identified uh, SNPs that are significantly associated for uh, 201 proteins. Um, and with a study-wide uh, um, significance level uh, for the correcting for the number of proteins, we identified PQTLs for 158 proteins. And this is, again, like to visualize the PQTL um, in one plot. So we had uh, two thirds uh, of cis PQTLs, which is very well aligned uh, uh, with previous literature and uh, compared to uh, 33 existing studies were identified around 300 novel PQTLs. And this is slide about the summary statistics, but I won't uh, go into detail because these will for sure change if we increase the sample size or increase the number of proteins. Uh, but I do want to highlight that 3% of the uh, variants are mid-sense variant, and this 
does have implications for uh, possibility of artifactual PQTL because of mismatch in the protein sequence database. So I developed a framework to uh, use peptide level data to directly eliminate artifactual PQTLs. I won't uh, go into detail, uh, but we can always come back in the discussion if anyone is interested. But in general, the idea is to, to, uh, to look at all the PQTLs and see if any of them are missense variants. And if yes, then we want to know um, if the variant peptide has been detected by MassBack. And if yes, if they have also further been used for protein quantification. And if yes, then we have to look at the peptide level uh, data to see if the signal purely arose from uh, that one variant peptide or it also has supporting evidence from the other peptides. So in the end, we uh, could eliminate PQTLs for one protein. Um, and this is to show you um, exactly what I just said before. So from the association, association test, we identified this variant um, that encodes a tyrosine instead of histidine at position 402 to be associated with, uh, with the protein level. But when we look at the peptide level data, um, the signal is only uh, comes from the variant peptide and it doesn't have supporting evidence from the other peptides. So this is a clear um, artifactual PQTLs. And then um, in a few other cases, even though the variant peptide did not uh, lead to artifactual PQTL, it could distort the effect size. So if you look at the, this, um, the, the peptide level data, you see this positive association between all the other peptides and the variant, but the downward or negative association for the variant peptide. Uh, so what I want to say here is it's very important to carry out to quality control um, after you have identified the PQTL from MS-based approach MS data. And the good thing is here we have the peptide level data that allows you to directly eliminate artifactual PQTL. I want to also uh, show you the fact size. at least I was quite surprised when I see um, that uh, genetic variants have such a big effect on plasma protein levels. And here I show you the top six proteins uh, with the highest uh, beta coefficient. Um, and we also identified in some cases, the same protein is regulated by more than by variants that are located on different chromosomes. For instance, here, the complement 4A uh, has uh, PQTLs located on chromosome 6 and also chromosome 15. And next, I want to briefly go through the replication results. Uh, you might look similar. So this uh, exactly is uh, the, the, the first study that I just talked about. Uh, we also had genomics data, so we use it for replication. Uh, so it did the same uh, data processing pipeline and uh, after QC, in theory, we could replicate 90% or we could test the replication for 90% of the PQTLs in this replication cohort. And we defined uh, the PQTL as replicated if the exact uh, protein and a SNP pair is also uh, significant in the replication cohort or for that same protein if we identify the variant that is in linkage disequilibrium. And we also apply the two levels of the significance, the nominal significance level, and then also buffer and corrected p-value. So with the nominal significance level, we uh, uh, replicated more than 8%, 80% of uh, all the primary PQTLs uh, identified in the discovery cohort. And uh, with a buffer and corrected p-value, then it's about 50. Um, and, uh, then when we, when we look at the uh, concordance in the effect size, uh, we had a Pearson correlation coefficient of uh, 0.97, showing a very high uh, concordant uh, effect size in terms of both direction and the strength. So again, this is uh, uh, some sign to check. Uh, so I hope you also agree with me that uh, the protein uh, abundance distribution between the genotypes uh, look very similar between the discovery and the replication cohort. So with this, um, I'm already coming to the end of my presentation. So to summarize, this is the first large scale protein wide PQTL study in children and uh, adolescents. Um, identified the largest set of PQTLs for plasma proteome 
identified by MS based of proteomics. Um, the majority of primary PQTLs were replicated in plasma in and out uh, cohort of liver disease with highly concordant effect sizes in direction and strength. Peptide level data can be used to directly eliminate artifactual PQTLs. Um, the study is still power limited in its discovery and downstream applications. Uh, in my perspective, to truly harness the translational power of PQTL studies, we need to have a, a even larger sample size and also deeper protein coverage. Nonetheless, I think that study shows that uh, high throughput MS-based proteomics offers new opportunities for discovery of PQTLs. And with that, I want to thank all the people who have contributed to the studies that I have uh, just uh, talked about, especially Matisse Mann for uh, being my PhD supervisor and also my postdoc supervisor, and also Simon Rasmussen for being my postdoc supervisor and uh, the Microbeliever Consortium for the clinical insights and the cohort and the clinical data. Um, no one knows this foundation for the funding and uh, also you for your attention and I will be happy to take any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Wow, this is really impressive work. Wonderful, thank you so much.